Thank you, Patty, for that nice introduction. I want to thank NAIA for inviting me and all of you for coming to hear what I have to say about this interesting subject. I like to start um, my talks with this phrase. Um, I use it in almost everything I do. Those who don't breed have no advantage over those who can't. And it reminds me back when I was in graduate school. And, and oh, I think everyone here can relate to the first three days of class. They're called drop and add. And you know what that meant? If you didn't like that class, you could drop it and take something else. And it didn't matter why, you know, it was too cold in the morning at eight o'clock for a class, you drop it. Okay, you can't find parking, you can drop it. There was a hundred reasons why. So I was taking a class that I couldn't drop because it was required for my major. And the professor was named Winston Kellogg. He was probably the most renowned experimental psychologist in the country at the time. And he loved to do research and lecture to students, but he hated to talk about grades and testing. So in the first day of class during drop and ad, Kellogg would say this, I'm gonna give you four tests, a hundred questions each. They're all multiple choice. If you get them all right, you get an A. You miss one, you get a B. You miss two, you get a C. If you miss more than that, you flunk the test. Now, is there anyone in here who does not understand how I'm going to grade? Well, for those who could drop his class <laughs> because it wasn't required, many of them did. Little did I know that 20, 25 years later, I would be a professor. And students would say to me, Dr. Battaglia, how are you going to grade us? So I thought about that. And I said, well, I'm going to give you four tests, 100 questions each. They're all multiple choice. 50% of your test questions are gonna come from your homework, 50%. And then I would go on to say, if there's anyone here who doesn't wanna do homework, this would be a good class to drop. And what happens is about 10% of the students drop. Why do I bother to tell you that story? Well, the same reason I tell them that story is the same reason I'm saying it here today. And that is, the subject that we're gonna get into is so big and there's so much known about what's going on in this area that you can't talk about it in one hour. So I have to rely on the fact that you're willing to read and you're willing to go to all the places where this information is available. So that's why I, uh, I talk about that in my lectures. If I can make this slide move to the next one. Oh, why won't it move? I need some help. <laughs> this just doesn't want to advance. Let's see. Can I, can I manually do it? Let's hold on a second. Oh, it's uh. There we go. Okay. Which which one is it? Let's go left. Okay. All right. So um, so let's look at how how big an issue we're talking about. Well, AKC registers uh, average million puppies a year. We have one hundred and seventy seven thousand breeders. Now that's how not how many are in the country. That's how many just AKC deals with. So it's a it's a big population. And with all of that going on, here's how the events are broken down. So you can see that confirmation is, is the big king, followed by agility and obedience, and then around to, to the others. So there's a lot going on here, and there's a lot of puppies involved being bred for different purposes. So then if you look at the 22,000 events that AKC sponsors with 3 million entries, there's a lot of people to talk to about a lot of things. So people who are in the breeding business generally breed and select for a purpose. And you can see, you know, all the kinds of things that, that are going on. And then, of course, you can see, I love this picture, because not only does she clear the bar, she's got, she's got enough space in there for two or three other dogs to go with her. So now, raising super puppies, how big is the problem? Well, at the very minimum, it's 177,000 breeders and a million puppies. So we're talking about a lot of people that have got to be brought up to the level of awareness about what's possible. So in the field of breeding dogs, what I've learned over the years is there's, there's eight skills that the very best breeders all have. The first skill is to have breed knowledge, to know who the best dogs are in your country and what they produce. 
but having breed knowledge means you also know what the dreaded diseases are in your breed. Those are the ones that kill, cripple, cause early death and blindness. And if you don't know what they are and you don't work on them first, you won't have a breeding program. Now, the second standard is, is uh, the second skill rather is the breed standard. And everybody says, oh, they know all about their breed standard and we're not gonna get into that uh, today. But then the, the, uh, the third uh, skill is a method by which we select sires and dams. And here's the first test question to the audience. Who in the room has never bred a litter? Let me see. Okay, well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, 17. Okay, you 17, watch everybody else. Okay. <laughs> now, everybody else except 17 for the, for the skill number three, okay, selecting sires and dam, what was the basis, the basis on which you selected the sire to breed to the dam? Okay, what was the basis for that? Was it that she has certain strengths and weaknesses he has certain strengths and weaknesses and you were offsetting them? Was that the rationale? Well, then let's go to the next part because there's a lot to that skill all in itself. How did you evaluate the pedigrees of the two dogs? How did you evaluate the pedigrees of the two dogs? And there's a lot of stuff there I'm gonna get into in a minute. Then we could talk about evaluating litters and choosing puppies. And here's where another problem goes wrong for most breeders. They combine those two skills. They combine evaluating litters with choosing puppies. And that's why most breeders are wrong 70% of the time when it comes to selecting their own puppy. They are wrong 70% 70, 70 of the time. And there's lots of data to support that because they get it all wrong when it comes to evaluating litters. You have to let the litter grow up. And then when they're grown, then you look to see how they came out. Hardly anybody does that. What they do is they pick the puppy they want place the rest of the puppies and then do everything to the one that they kept or the two that they kept. And, and that's, how they, that's how they look at both skills, neither of which works. And that's why usually the one they choose don't, doesn't work out the way they thought it was gonna work out. Then the next thing is how do they go about uh, uh, having a record system? So, so here, here's the one I really like. If I was visiting you today, I, I happen to come to your house knocked at the door, said, you know what? I was in the neighborhood. I, you invited me to stop in if I was ever in the city. Here I am. How about if I have a cup of coffee and let's talk about your last litter, the last litter. So everybody with 17 can relate to this. So why don't you get the records in the last litter? Let's put them on the table Then you and I will talk about it. What do you suppose they put on the table? Okay, they put the ribbons, the rosettes, the glassware, the silverware, a couple of pedigrees. I say, okay, we got it all there. It's all on it. Whatever you use to do that last litter, it's on the table. What's heritable that's on the table? What is heritable? And so when you begin to think about it, not much, if anything, is on the table that's heritable. So the basis of the breeding system is based on what? Okay, it is not heritable information. All right, so we're going to skip that now. We're going to go to what I consider to be probably one of the most important skills, and that's to manage, feed, and develop what you keep. And this is where I think a lot of breeders need a lot of help, and that's why I wanna start with this. So if we look at the left-hand side of the screen over here, you can see that selecting the sire in a dam, offsetting strengths, uh, strengths and weaknesses, and keeping records is the first thing that everybody should wanna do. So let's look at how breeders look at breeding and what they believe is going to happen. A lot of them think it's just a roll of the dice. You know, you just hope for the best. Okay, you never know what you're going to get. So the way I look at it is that rather than hope for the best, which is not a very good strategy, why not breed and manage by direction rather than by chance? You heard Mark this morning talk about the golden age, you know, all this new stuff that's coming. You heard Claire talk about, you know, where technology is going. We live in a time that nobody in history could imagine. 10, 15 years ago, many of the skills, many of the tools we have, many of the ideas and discoveries weren't around 10 or 15 years ago. They're all here now. So, so people who are breeding today have an advantage nobody in history has ever had. The problem is their awareness of what's available. And that's where I think our biggest challenge is. So let's take a look at 
pedigrees. This is what everybody, everybody in the audience knows what pedigrees look like. Okay. So the question is, there's how many, how many ancestors are in that pedigree? Well, there's 14 ancestors in three generations. Each ancestor has seven traits described in the breed standard. That's the second skill of a breeder, the, 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 uh, the, the breed standard. And the, and the traits are broken down in the breed standard by the head, ears, neck, front, back, rear, and tail. So if you took one dog and you say, you know the breed standard, you should know what those seven traits are based on the breed standard of your breed. But what happens is on the pedigree on the left, you can't see those seven traits. So if you were gonna, so if you were gonna know your pedigree, you'd have to remember 14 ancestors times those seven traits. That's 96 things to remember about one pedigree. So if you breed that pedigree to another pedigree, the sire and the dam, how many traits have you put together? Okay, you, you can begin to see how big the, the problem is in terms of what breeders know about the dogs that they're about to breed. Now, the, the pedigree on the right is called the stick dog pedigree. And if you look at the stick dog, it has seven structural parts. So you can count them. The ears are one, the head is two, the neck is three, the front is four, the middle piece or back is five, the rear is six, and the tail is seven. All of them are described in the breed standard. So if we had a way to code, to code those seven parts, and we said, okay, let's, uh, let's say that the part, well, we take the ears. If the ears were correct on, on the dog in the stick dog pedigree, we would color them blue. Okay, if they could be improved, because you'll hear people say, well, you know, the ears are really nice, but I'd like them yeah, a little bit better. Okay, well, we won't coat them black. We'll, we'll, I mean, we won't coat them blue, we'll coat them black. And if the ear was hanging off to the side or something in the breed standard said, this is a fault, we color those ears red. And if it was a serious fault, they didn't stand up or whatever it was, they were disqualifying, we, we color them gray. And if we didn't know, we would color them green. So with those colors, using a stick dog pedigree, we can look at a dog and we can see that the dog on the screen, his ears, head, neck are all blue, which means based on the breed standard, they're correct. All right, so let's look at a, a typical breeding where the, the breeder knows about the dog they're about to breed. All the, all the parts are blue except the ears and they could stand a little improvement and they know who the mother is. Beyond that, they don't have any information about the seven structural parts of the other 12 dogs in the pedigree. So when we talk about breeding strength and weaknesses, we've got a long way to go. So that's just the confirmation of the dog. Now we got another part of the dog to think about and that's the health, the health side of the dog. And now instead of talking about just confirmation, which is called depth of pedigree, because we're talking about three generations deep, we switch from depth to breadth. Breadth of the pedigree means we're going we're gonna to talk about the litter mates, okay, and not try to go back two and three generations. So in this particular uh, slide, uh, the, the, the symbols are coded, the, the squares are males, and the uh, circles are female. So we can see that the male here, that he had two sisters. He was bred to this bitch and she had one brother and one sister. And that, that breeding produced a litter of six, five boys and a girl. So we can then say, well, why is this pedigree important to us? Well, it identifies gender. It can identify the carriers because we're talking about health. It can identify special dogs of interest, some great stud dog or brood bitch in the pedigree. We can look at the frequency with which the traits or the disorders occur. We can look for trends and patterns and we can look at risk. What is the risk that this pedigree could produce good or bad things when we talk about health? So here, here, you, here you typically see you know, that pedigree and now with a, a little color code again, we can start to look at things and drill down into them more specifically. So in this pedigree, uh, the coding system says that if you use a dot of a color, that dot means that whatever that color represents, that is a carrier. So if we look at this pedigree, which 
we, we can, we're going to now track four different things. Green means we're going to track uh, cancer. Red means we're going to do uh, cataracts. I'm trying to read it now. Help my glasses. Uh, dark green means we're going to do uh, coronary or hearts, and uh, yellow is going to be hip dysplasia. So if we look at the pedigree, it's all green. So while these are the four traits that we're, we're interested in because they're all dreaded diseases, when we look at the pedigree, what do we know about the health of that dog and its ancestors? Because it's all coated green, it means we know nothing. So from a health standpoint, we're breeding blind. And that's what the reality of this kind of uh, logic and this kind of pedigree talks about. So now we can, we can put all three pedigrees up there so the pedigree on the left is the one where we know all the names and titles and uh, all of the things that go on that pedigree. The one in the middle, the stick dog pedigree, now we can look at the quality of the confirmation or the lack of quality. And then the pedigree on the right will tell us all about the health of, of that particular uh, dog. So if we were a good breeder and we could put a sire and a dam together, offsetting strength and weaknesses, we should be able to produce a superior puppy. So let's assume that we've, we've done that. We've, we've done strength and weaknesses. We found the best two dogs to mate, and now we're on our way to having genetically a superior puppy. So we've concentrated the genes we want. So how do superior puppies come along? They come along because somebody was able to stitch ideas together stitch ideas together. So that's what we're gonna do for the rest of this hour is we're gonna talk about how to stitch those ideas together. So item number one here is we've already done the selection of the, uh, of, the, of the parents. Now I know I'm moving pretty fast, but in an hour, we got a lot to cover. So now let's look at the next thing we could do. We put the best two parents together. So we should have on its way, a really good quality puppy, but there's other things we could do. We could supplement that bitch with a vitamin called DHA. So we're now down to the using the ACE skill. So we're gonna manage, feed, and develop what we keep. And what are the things we wanna manage? We wanna manage nutrition. We're gonna talk about early neurological stimulation. We're gonna talk about the maternal influence and what the dam influences on the puppies and how we can manipulate that. We're gonna talk about dogs with better backs, better elbows, better feet, and fewer missing testicles. And we put that all together and we really got a superior puppy. So let's, let's see what we can do. From a nutrition standpoint, here's a piece of research I think everyone will find interesting. This was done by a, a group of guys called, uh, well, Russ, and, uh, Russ Kelly and uh, Huston, I think was, was the other research. So what they did is they, they went to some human research because so many times, Things that, are, that work in human research also work in dogs. And in this case, there's a vitamin called DHA. Almost every pregnant woman in America for the last 10 or 20 years has had that vitamin in her diet. It's prescribed by almost all the doctors. And the reason it's prescribed is because it enhances the brain of the fetus. It enhances the brain of the fetus. So Kelly and Hoffman were wondering, would it enhance the brain of a puppy? So they took three colonies of bitches. So you can see colony A, colony AB, and colony B. Three colonies of bitches. So once this research was out there and published, all the manufacturers of dog foods decided they were gonna put this on their label because they want everybody to know they had added DHA to their dog food. So if you look at all the dog food today, you look at the ingredients, everybody will have DHA there. What they don't tell you is how much DHA is there. So what, what the researchers did is they said, okay, we'll just go to the store, like all of us would, buy a bag right off the shelf, and, and this is how they started the research. So here was the plan. The day you breed the bitch, you're going to feed her this diet. So you bought a bag of dog food off the shelf. This is what she's going to eat. Now she has her litter of puppies 63 days later, okay? She eventually weans them and then the puppies start to eat the same dog food. When the puppies are 14 weeks old, their brains are 90% developed. So that's the best time to test them if you're gonna test them. So those puppies, when tested, they got 30% of the problems right. So the researchers went on and took a second colony of bitches 
bought the same dog food, but added a little bit of DHA to the, to the diet. When the puppies were weaned, they ate the diet with a little bit of DHA added. And when tested at 14 weeks, they got 42% of the problems right. Then came the big test, okay? They're gonna, they're gonna use the vitamin right out of the hole, vitamin right out of the bottle. And here's two different uh, bottles of DHA. The one on the left is a thousand milligrams. The one on the right is 500 milligrams. So at 14 weeks, they're gonna test, they're gonna test that last colony. And sure enough, they got, well, if I get this right. Okay. They got 68% of the problems right. So now two best dogs were bred together. So we should have a pretty nice puppy because we've offset strength and weaknesses. We did the stick dog pedigree and the symbols pedigree. Now we're gonna feed that that puppy through its mother and through gestation and then until it's 14 weeks old, DHA. So now we've got a smarter puppy that's been bred better. So what else can we do? So we can come to the next item uh, of things that we can do, stitching ideas together, and that is to stimulate the neurological system of the, of the puppy. I wrote this paper a long time ago. It was based on secret research done by our government, secret research. Which means, which means it's not all available. So anyways, uh, early neurological stimulation in the research world was called biosensor. That was the code word used by the government. And this research was done during the Vietnam War. The whole purpose of the research was the government discovered that the Vietnam War was gonna be fought in the jungle, which is not where the government typically wants to fight a war. So when they got in the jungle, they found out that bad things were going on. There was trip wires, guys up in trees, there were snipers down in the swamps. It was a mess. So they, they created this secret breeding program called Biosensor. The, the goal was to produce a dog that could hear air pass over a trip wire in a jungle. A dog that could spot snipers in the tree and could find them down in the swamps. So that research went on for a while. They discovered what they wanted to discover. And then unfortunately the press got a hold of the secret research, made a big scandal out of it and shut it down. And then they locked up the records and everybody walked away like nothing had happened. I happened to come along at the time and the journal asked me to write the article. So it took a while to do the research and find these guys who were involved and gather all the data that was involved. And I wrote the paper, Early Neurological Stimulation. I never called a biosensor for obvious reasons. I didn't want the press on my back <laughs> talking about this. So anyways, so let's talk about what they, what they discovered. So they found that early life is a time when the physical immaturity of the organism, this is the newborn pup, okay, that this pup is susceptible and responsive to a restricted but important class of stimuli. So let's see what that really means in, in English, if you will. Well, what's an immature uh, puppy? Well, an immature puppy is one that has subnormal body temperature, has an elevated heartbeat, has, it can only, it has limitations. It can only suck, crawl, smell, and maybe some limited vision. Because don't forget, it's, it's three to 16 days old. It cannot maintain body heat, which is why they sleep in piles, and it cannot digest its food unless the mother licks them, rolls them over, and causes digestion to occur. The puppy cannot shiver, gag, urinate, defecate without her stimulation. So this is truly an immature organism. All right, so what can, what can happen to an immature organism at that time if you're gonna stimulate the neurological system? Well, we know, we know that the neurological system never sleeps. And they found that if they stimulated the neurological system once a day, for three to five seconds that they would produce a dog that, that could have a lot of uh, interesting uh, characteristics. Um, now the stimulations were the ones on the screen. They're gonna stimulate, they're gonna use the Q-tip and these are your props. Yeah. And you're, you're gonna take a washcloth from the hotel that you're in. <laughs> you're, gonna, you're gonna wring it out you're gonna put it in the refrigerator and you're gonna get it nice and cold. 
And after it's been there a good 30 minutes, you're gonna lay it down on the table, which is where eventually we're gonna put the puppy. All right, so when we do all of that, we're gonna take the, uh, the Q-tip and we're gonna stimulate the surface. Well, here's a couple of litters. The, the one up in the corner is one of my litters of 12. Um, I had her x-rayed and they said she was gonna have 10. So they missed it by two. And I bred her two more times. They missed it all three times because I didn't do what uh, uh, you would, where you, you suggested do two views, they did one. And so we never got it right. So uh, I won't make that mistake again. So anyways, um, she always had larger litters like that. And I was always wrong because I relied on the one view. And so uh, that was a lesson learned. All right, so, um, so let's talk about this stimulation. So here's typically what she would do. Sometimes you pick the puppy up, the mom comes over to look to see, well, what are you doing? So here you are, here I am rather, I'm holding a puppy up and with my Q-tip, I'm gonna to try to find a place on this puppy that is normally not touched during three to 16 days of age. And that place happens to be between the toes. So you can take your little Q-tip, you try to get between the toes and you count one, two, three, four, five. So we've stimulated the tactile area for three to five seconds once a day, but I still have the puppy in my hand. So what else can I do? So I can go to the second exercise. Where are we here? Second exercise, and that is to hold the puppy straight up like this. So his head's up, his head's up, and what's happening? Blood now starts to come out of his brain because gravity is simply taking it, taking it down. And I'm gonna hold him there. One, two, three, four, five. Now the neurological system sees this as a problem because if I keep him there long enough, he's gonna have enough blood in his brain to survive. So the neurological sees it as a problem and begins to pump the blood back up into the brain so we can stabilize it and, and survive. Now, in normal situations, no puppy is held like that during this period of three to 16 days. So this, is, this gives the neurological system a job to do. Now, the next exercise is to reverse what we just did, and that is to hold the head down so it's pointed to the ground. Now, too much blood is going to the brain. And if we hold them there long enough, bad things are gonna happen. But the neurological system, again, recognizes this as a problem and pumps the blood out of the brain back up into the head. Now, just to show you how powerful the neurological system is, we got the, we got the college football season coming up. And we know that across the country, I can remember back when my days in school, there's a bunch of guys that got drunk every Saturday after the game. Now, some of them passed out when they were drunk and some of them passed out in the stairwells. And nobody knew that they had passed out in the stairwells and they'd find them in the morning, but their heads were down and their legs were up. They just fallen on the stairs and they laid there all night long. Normally they should all be dead. They should all be dead because that is too much blood to be in the brain for that long a period of time. Why aren't they all dead? They're not dead because they're in their neurological system sees that as a problem pumps the blood out of their brain so it stabilizes the body and they wake up in the morning with a big headache. That goes to show you how important this neurological system is, is to the human and is to the, to the puppy. So now while we still have the same puppy in our hand, we, we go to the next position, which is a supine position or the most submissive position to put a canine in. The alpha puppies like this one are gonna show you they are alpha. And by the time you get to the 16th day with this alpha puppy, you better hang on to him because he's gonna jump right out of your hands if you hold him there very long. But you count again, one, two, three, four, five. Now we get to the next exercise, which is my little cloth here that's nice and wet and cold. And I set the puppy down four feet, his little pink feet, his little pink belly, and he doesn't like it. And he's gonna let you know he doesn't like it but again, we're gonna count one, two, three, four, five. Now, if we do that from the third to the 16th day, 
once a day to each puppy in the litter, this is what the expectation is. They're going to have improved cardio performance, which means they're going to have they're going to have better heart rates. They're going to have stronger heart beats. They'll have more adrenaline when they need it. They'll have greater tolerance of stress and greater resistance of disease for the rest of their life. That is a heck of a gift to give to your puppies. So now let's look at what we've done. We bred the best two dogs together to produce this puppy. Then we fed its mother DHA to give it a, make it smarter and more trainable. Now we've gone through early neurological stimulation. Stitching ideas together is making us produce a very, very superior puppy. So what else can we do with this puppy? Can you remember, we're working on the A skill, manage, feed, and develop what you keep. So the A skill says, well, the maternal influence, uh, there's a lot going on there. So you'll see uh, moms do lots of interesting things with their pups. And then comes along this researcher named Slabbert. He found that early separation of the dam from her puppies has a negative effect on the physical condition of the dog, its weight gain, and its susceptibility to disease. Wow. So all you have to do is not take these puppies away from their mom early. So the next thing Slabbert found is that those weaned earlier than six weeks have significantly lower performance ratings when tested as adults. So if you have, if you're in the performance world and you're into herding ability, agility, uh, working dog sports or hunting, any of those things, weaning early is not to the advantage of your puppies. So Slabbert was finding a lot of interesting things the breeders can use. Then he found this. He was interested in, in narcotics detection. So he wanted to know how could he help make a better narcotics puppy. And here's what he found. He, he thought about this for a while and said, you know, in the wild, the, the maternal lessons that puppies learn comes from their mothers. The, the lion takes her puppy out, puts it or her pig takes her cub out, puts it down in the grass, and she lets the cub watch her do the hunting. And then as the, as the cubs get older, she lets them participate. And so that's how they learn to become good hunters themselves. But, they, but, the, but the research and the people who got into this found out that if something happened to the mother and she was not able to take their cub out and let them watch her hunt, most of those cubs died. They were not able to hunt themselves because they were never taught to do it. So he got thinking, I wonder if I let my puppies watch their trained narcotics mother find narcotics, are they better at it? So he did what the other researchers did. He had three colonies of bitches. The first colony of bitches, the puppies watched their mother find the narcotics. In the second colony, the puppies watched a female who was not their mother find narcotics. And then in the third colony, which is what most people do in, in this uh, working dog area, they grow the puppy up until it's old enough to train, and then they train the puppy. And what, what uh, Slabbert found is those who watched their own mother perform were significantly better than all the other puppies. So then the question was, well, if it works in narcotics, will it work in bomb detection? Will it work for herding dog people? Will it work for people who want obedience dogs and agility dogs? And the answer was yes. Yes, let the puppies watch their mother. So everybody can do that. You just have to set up the environment and then, and then teach the puppies to watch. So there's a lot of ways to do this. And I'm just showing you a couple of the ones that I've run across. So what else can we do? We're working again on the A skill, okay? So let's see what we can do for our puppies. And that is the top line. Now, if you're in confirmation and you have a dog who comes in the ring with a, with a back that looks like this or this, you're, you're somewhat in trouble. You know, most judges are not gonna appreciate that top line and the dog, dog's gonna be faulted. So the question is, is this a breeder's problem or is this a problem of the ACE skill? Knowing how to manage, feed, and develop the top line of the puppies you keep. So here's what I found out about that. If you let a young growing puppy eat too much and carry a big belly of food around all day long, his top line is not gonna be strong and hard when, he, when he's grown and when he needs it. So what's, what's the fix? 
Well, top lines, what I found is top lines need more rest, not more exercise. So if you see the litter over here on the left, okay, they're all watching these adult dogs and they're like, like any, any puppy, you know, puppies are interested in learning everything. So if there's something moving around, they're gonna, they're curious and they're gonna be over there. Here's another litter of puppies and they're gonna watch this adult dog. So when they should be resting, they're on their feet paying attention to the adult dog. Because in, in, puppy war, in the puppy world, we know this, they sleep at the same time, they pee at the same time, and they poop at the same time. And if you wanna interrupt that, that cycle, all you have to do is bring an adult into the environment that they can see and they're going to be uh, they're going to be on their feet when they should be sleeping and resting those top lines. So what's the fix of having better top lines? Take vision away so that they can't see these adult dogs all day and you end up with puppies with better top lines. So what else can we do to make this puppy that we put together because we put the right parents together? We use DHA, we stimulate the neurological system. We've, we've done some work on improving the puppy through the maternal influence. And now let's see what we can do about another part of the puppy, the structure. Now, look, let's think about the elbows for a minute. Elbow dysplasia is a big issue in a lot of breeds. So if, if you look at what the puppies do, they like to grab a hold of things and they'll pull them around and they'll have all kinds of interesting things that they do. So I happened to be in Hanover, Germany, and I went to see an orthopedic uh, veterinarian there. He was considered probably the, the top uh, orthopedic of his day. And I was at the University of Hanover. His name was Wilhelm Brass. And I asked him about this. He wanted to talk about hip dysplasia. I wanted to talk about elbow dysplasia. So, so we talked about what he wanted to talk about. And then I got to my subject, which was elbow dysplasia. And here's what he told me. He said, the, if you look at the x-ray on, uh, on the left, yeah, over there, no, down on the right. Yeah, this one. Okay, you, you see, that's the way a normal elbow should look. The ankyneal process fuses at four months of age is that a little bone on the end of the elbow attaches itself to the bone and it becomes one, one uh, unique uh, piece of structure. However, if you let the puppy do bad things with his elbow, oops, where am I here? Let's see if I, well, maybe I can't back it up. Okay, if you, if you, if you let him play tug of war, okay, you can, you can actually fracture that because you're putting stress on the elbow. And what, here's what Brass told me. He said, you know, over here in Germany, we put a lot of tension and, and a lot of emphasis on how much drive, attention, and demand a, a, a young dog will, will want and will take. So the way they measure that is by playing tug of war. See if he will he'll, he'll hold on to that and then, you know, try to pull it away from you. And he said, if we do this at four months of age, when that ankyneal process is just trying to fuse, he says, we just break it. He says, you just fracture it and you have an ununited ankyneal. Or in English, you have elbow dysplasia. So he said, we changed the age at which we're going to evaluate puppies. So we moved it from four months to five and six months and reduced elbow dysplasia by 40%. So when I came back to the country, and I started meeting with the working groups that I work with, I told them this story. And sure enough, it wasn't long before people started to say, you know, grass was right. You know, we, if, if we just, if we want to find out how much drive that dog has to possess and keep what he has, uh, we let him, let him grab the towel, but let him run with it. Don't, don't let him fight for it. Because when he fights for it, if you're in that four month period, you're surely gonna have a, a, an elbow problem as the puppy gets older. So we've learned one more thing that we could do to help this puppy get to be better. So, there we go. So what else can we do? Now, now we know, we know that dogs are barefoot. The owners are not, okay? Your dogs are all barefoot and, and, and you're not. What would happen if we put permanent sneakers on our dogs? Put, put sneakers on your dog. So how, how can we do that? Well, here's what I found out, that if you take a young puppy 
<clears throat> and you look at its toenails when he's really small, you'll see there's a lot of toenail there. But if you, if you begin to nip the ends of those toenails every eight days, from the time he's a little baby puppy until he starts to grow and become mature at seven or eight months, you will forever put a pair of sneakers on that dog. Now, once he's got a pair of sneakers on himself, then you're gonna protect his elbows, his shoulders, and his hips because he's wearing sneakers. And, and you can simply do that by, by snipping the ends of those toenails <clears throat> When they're, when they're puppies and you do it every eight days so they don't touch the floor. So what else can we do? Well, missing testicles is something that we hear about a lot. So I, I went into the literature to see, you know, what's the frequency with which average breeds have missing testicles? And the answer is less than 1%. So breeders who have litters and more than 1% of their puppies have missing testicles there probably is something going on other than the heredity involved. So I got, I got looking at that and I thought, you know, I wonder what else we could find out. So I found out that if we took all the breeders in the room, oh, thank you, Patty. We took all the breeders in the room and said, all right, all the men, you guys get on the left side. All the women, you, got, you go over here. And then I asked for a, a hands up about who has missing testicles and how many. More women will put their hands up than men. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that's what I thought, more men. Well, why would the gender of the breeder make a difference in terms of the number of missing testicles you have? So it can't be the gender, they can't be the gender of the breeder, something else is going on. And so what I found is, I found what you see on the screen. Women have longer, fingernails than men. And they're, what they're trying to do is they're trying to find that little BB. Okay, now in some breeds, that little BB is a tiny little BB and it's in a pouch. And if you try to find that little BB in that pouch and you're using your fingers as opposed to mine, the chances of you bruising one or both are very, very high. And so what happens is more women tend to have puppies with missing testicles than men. Now I tell, I use this slide and I tell this story at every seminar I've done since 2009. And I counted it up just because I thought, well, somebody's gonna ask me that question today. So I've, I've given 200 seminars since 2009. And I've told this same story every time. In every seminar I've done, bar none, at least one or two people in the audience send me a private letter later and they allow us to say like uh, dr battaglia thank you for your your suggestion i followed the idea and i have less missing testicles than i used to so what is it that i suggested to the audience the suggestion is this don't look until you have to know don't look until you have to know you don't have to know at seven weeks okay whether your male puppies have testicles because you're not doing anything with them in seven weeks. Most of the time, you're not doing anything with eight weeks. The longer you wait, the larger the testicle is, the easier it is to find. Two weeks ago, I did a seminar at one of your neighboring, uh, one of the neighboring clubs, let's just say that. And one of the breeders came up to me and said, you know, I breed uh, uh, 13 inch beagles. And about more than 60% of my male puppies have one or, or two missing testicles. I said, oh my God. I says, well, you know, the average for the for your breed or any other breed is less than 1%. So if you're at 60%, something is going on that has nothing to do with heritability. So I told her this story about the fingernails. And she says, I, I try to find them at six weeks. Well, can you imagine, take a beagle at six weeks old. How big is that beagle? It's smaller than that little uh, toy that uh, that was on the table th this morning. At any rate, so you can see her chances of bruising one or both are, are really high. So all she has to do is stop that. And she's probably going to have more success in her breeding program than she has right now. So all she has to do is, is keep that in mind, is not go hunting for them before she has to know. So, what, so we're stitching these ideas together. So what else can she do? 
Okay, so, well, you can start doing table work pretty early, and you're going to hear that probably from the next speaker about all the things you can do involving the socialization. So these are some of the things that I do really early. I get them up on the table, start handling their head, their mouth, so they're used to all this kind of uh, activity uh, as soon as they're six, seven, eight weeks old. And then we take them over to one of my favorite places, which is one of the pet stores and over to Home Depot, and they get used to all that noise out there. And then fortunately, because the Atlanta airport is not too far away, we can take them down and let them really find out what noise, smell, surfaces, and people are all about. So the thing we avoid is this. And this goes on every day at almost all of our dog shows. Somebody comes to the show and they bring their puppies because they want everybody to see their new puppies and they want to get out and, quote, socialize their puppies. Now, at the end of the day, this lady is dead tired. It's from morning to night. That's all she's done with her puppies is bring them out there and, so and let them hang around with her friends and listen to all the oohs and ahs. However, her puppies didn't get the... Uh, exposure that they could have got if she would have just changed one thing. If she'd have taken a puppy on the left and put it in the kennel, taken the other puppy, so she has one puppy. So all morning long with that one puppy, that one puppy is getting all that attention and it's not being divided between that puppy and, and the other litter mate. She put that puppy back in the kennel when she comes back for lunch and then she takes the other puppy out. So the other puppy gets a lot of individual attention. At the end of the day, she is just as tired, but the difference is the effect it had on those two puppies. There's a big difference between taking them together and taking them out one at a time. All right, so now um, the last thing, and before I, I wrap it up and we have some questions, is this thing about selecting puppies. The typical thing that goes on in the selection of most puppies is here's two girls. They're both looking at puppies. Now, you ask yourself, which puppy do you think they're not going to take? Okay. Well, my guess is this guy down here who pays no attention to them, he's not even in the he's not even in the mix. But we've got one up here who's licking her face. The other one's got a hold of her hand. So I'm gonna guess it's gonna be between those two. So that's how selection goes on for, for most people who are interested in just having a puppy. So if the puppy pays a lot of attention to them, that's generally the puppy that gets selected. So that's not a very good process when it comes to selection because all of the things that we know about puppies, okay, is not based on whether they lick your hands or whether they, they like you or not. So here's what I found out. If you're gonna do something about the 70% of the people who are wrong when they pick puppies, you have to, you have to choose an age at which you're gonna evaluate them. You have, to have, you have to decide how many times are you gonna evaluate them or is it one, one test and that's it? You know, if you don't do it right today, it's all or nothing. That, that is a sign of, of failure. And then the question is, what's the surface going to look like? What are the surroundings? And are you going to evaluate them one at a time? So I'll just quickly walk you through this. This was my friend, Jim. He says to me, you have to come over and see my litter. I said, oh, uh, yeah. He said, bring your camera. We're going to look at side gate. So I go over there, and here was the puppy. I thought, oh, my God. He can hardly get through the grass. So I'm, I, I lay down on my belly. I had the camera. And I said, okay, Jim, you call her and I'm gonna, I'm gonna shoot a picture of Sidegate. So this was, this was Sidegate. So, so not only is the age wrong, the surface is wrong. So, so if we start to look at the surfaces on which people evaluate puppies, you know, the grass hides everything. So if we use a surface where, where nothing, is, nothing gets hidden, okay? This, these are unforgiving surfaces. You see exactly what's there and you miss nothing. Now, here's one of the techniques I like to use a lot. You just buy this stuff at Home Depot or somewhere, uh, and, and you let the puppy go, go down, you let the puppy come back, and you videotape this, and then you put it in slow motion. Now you can see a whole lot about whether the legs are straight, whether they can move them correctly, and all the things that you might wonder about. Now, evaluating them one at a time is something that uh, takes a lot of time, so a lot of breeders don't do it. You know, time has become our enemy. And that's one of the things as a breeder you have to avoid. If time is your enemy and you want to get there first, then you're going to have a lot of problems on the way. <clears throat> so this, uh, this puppy happens to be on one of the videos that I put out there on choosing the best puppy. And if you look at 
the, the other puppy, their two brothers, they're marked exactly the same. And when they're out there together, they both look like this. Their tails are up, their heads are erect. Okay, they walk, they run with a lot of animation. And then you put one back in the crate and you take the other one out. One looks like this, he never changes. The other one, when you switch him, the other one is an entirely new, different puppy. His tail is down, he takes two or three steps, he's unsure of himself. As soon as I put his brother out there with him, who becomes his crutch, he starts to look like his brother. So if I evaluated them together, it would be a toss up as to which one you would take. If I separate them, so I'm only looking at one at a time, there's no doubt which one you would take and which one you would not. So there's a lot of things to see when we're looking at puppies, but you can't look at them in a gang. Now, one of the things, and this will be the last thing that I'm gonna talk about, give you a chance to ask some question, is pay attention to who gates and who trots, okay? So what's the difference between a dog, if you think of them, if you were in the show ring and one dog is galloping all the way around the ring and the other one is trotting all the way around the ring, which one has the advantage? Okay. So the question is, when you see this as puppies, what's going on? And what's going on is there's a structural difference. So it's a matter of paying attention to who gates and, and who doesn't gate. So the thing is, you can't do this on one day because some of them have a good day and a bad day just because of stuff that happens. So, so, you, so, you, so you cannot do everything in one day, which means it takes time. So time cannot be your enemy if you're going to evaluate and develop really super puppies. So what I've tried to do in this little bit of time is kind of run through a whole lot of things you can do to produce super puppies from the time we breed them through all of the steps that we just taken care of. So with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna close and give you a chance to ask a few questions before the next speaker comes up. So anyone have, yes, Betty, thank you. Can you talk about growth plate? Because this is something that a lot of people is not aware of, particularly in the larger breed. And what stage? The only need? growth, the only area of growth and structurally that I can talk about is one I just mentioned, which is what Dr. Brass talked about in terms of the elbows. Um, I'm sure there's other veterinarians here, uh, people who are veterinarians, I'm not but who can talk about uh, growth plates and the importance of it. But a puppy needs a certain amount of rest. There's no doubt about that. And, and people who have puppies that run with their adults from the time they're little to the time they're grown never produce as good a puppy as they could have produced if they give that puppy enough time to rest and develop his, his, uh, his body. Okay, another question? I have a question about the uh, supplement, um, the DHA. DHA. So um, I've never supplemented extra than what's in the food already. I mean, should we be supplementing extra then? Well, um, again, I'm not a nutritionist, so I can only tell you what I've heard the nutritionists say in the meetings I've gone to where they are the experts. Most of the not most, but many of the dog foods produced today have no research to back them up. What they have is a lot of good marketing and you see it on television. You know, all these wonderful things, these puppies rush up and just eat that stuff up. And then you hear all the wonderful things. And the owner says, before I fed him this dog food, he couldn't walk and he had this and he had that. Now that I'm feeding him this, look at him. And it goes on and on and on. And then you, you go to the store to see where the dog food is sold and you see if there's any research. So you go online and look and see if there's any research and you find there's none, there's none. So they're good marketers, but there's nothing to back them up. Now, people will buy those dog foods with nothing to back them up and no research and supplement it. So they're altering the formula of whatever it is. And when you start altering the formula of dog foods that are supposedly prepared to do a certain kinds of things, there are unintended consequences. And there's tons of research to support that. So my attitude is if you're feeding a high quality dog food, I mean, $100 a bag of dog food is like eating steak every day for me and you, okay? How many dogs need that high a quality of dog food? Most of them don't because they're not working. They're hanging around the house all day. So those dog foods are also being supplemented. Last week, I judged a dog show and a lady brought a, uh, uh, a young 
puppy, it was a, a, car, a, a corgi, a Pembroke. And, the pup, and that puppy had to be as wide as he was long. I'd, I'd never seen a puppy this big in my life. And, and so she walked in the ring. She didn't think there was anything wrong with a puppy. And she put it on the table. And I said, ma'am, you know, your puppy's a little heavy. Well, yeah, I've, I've, you know, she kind of, then, then she starts telling me all the things that she feeds this puppy. Not only does she feed a high quality dog food, she supplements it with canned dog food and vitamins. And, and I mean, you couldn't alter a formula more than what this lady did, but she didn't know. So there was a representative there from one of the uh, uh, dog food companies. And I says, you know, I think you'd be better off talking to this person. They might help you with this. So she went over there. I found out later that uh, they, they gave her a lot of advice about overeating and how much. She feeds this, this puppy three cups in the morning. Now, this is a corgi and three cups at night. I'm surprised the puppy would eat that much. But anyways, when you looked at the puppy, you would believe it. So anyways, I think if you're feeding high quality dog foods, you, you need to be very careful if you're going to supplement them because usually you're altering the formula. And that's not a good idea. Yeah, Dan. One question and a comment. Um, if we look back at some of the pictures that Mark Dunn had up there this morning of the old breeder kennels and all that stuff, um, I think what happened is that they used to keep their their litters much later in their development, and they would keep them on the premises till they're four, five, six months old and evaluate them at that point. And most of our breeders nowadays, we're trying to move puppies out at eight to 10 weeks of age. And I think, the, what is your idea on what age they should be placed in a, well, in a home? Dan, that's a great question. It leads right into what I said earlier. 70% of the breeders are wrong. Now, how do I know that? And I'm going to back into your question. How do I know that? So I've often wondered, you know, why do some people seem to have all these great winning dogs? And then I started to look to see, did they breed the winning dog that they have? And the answer was no. So I started then to look around from, you know, going to all the, I've been to, I've judged 23 different national specialties myself. So when I get to catalogs and I look to see who the big winning dogs are, who bred them and who owns them, they're not the same people. So you ask yourself, if you bred the top dog in your breed, the best brood bitch, the futurity winner, all of these kind of things, why wouldn't you own it? 70% of them don't. So the question is that something's going on. So then you start talking to the breeders about when did you decide to keep this puppy? Okay. Yeah. Eight to 10 weeks is about right. Eight to 10 weeks. Well, how, how big, how big is a puppy at eight to 10 weeks? He's maybe a fourth or a half of his size. So the example I use is people. Okay. I have a son who was an NFL linebacker. Now, when he was in third or fourth grade, he would be about the equivalent of an eight week old puppy. So if I went to the third grade, when that son of mine was a student in school, there'd be no way in hell I would ever suspect that he'd be big enough and good enough to be in the NFL, let alone go to college. Okay. And, 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 that, and that's what happens to with, with uh, so many of our breeders. We're trying, the, the, the clock has become our enemy. So when we, when we try to do that, the old guys had kennels. They could keep these dogs. Most people today don't have kennels. So they keep thinking, oh my God, I can't keep six. I mean, they're going to drive me nuts because they don't have the facilities to do it. So they get a, they want to keep the one they think is the best one or place it with somebody, get rid of all the others as pets. And that's why the mistake level is so high. And you hear the judges say, oh my God, you should have saw what I had to judge this morning. And you know, you hear all these kind of stories because I think we the situation is, that one, they don't have the ability to keep that many puppies. So they want to they want to pick the best one now and then they go on. And what we found is that's the wrong way to pick puppies. Pick the worst one first, the worst one first, and sell it. Who's left? The best five. Sell the worst one. Who's best? Who's left? The best four. So a process of elimination gets you to the best puppy. But we turn that around. We want to pick the best one first, get rid of everybody else. And the odds of being right is like picking my son in third grade as an NFL linebacker. It isn't going to happen. So that's my take. <laughs> All right. Am I done? Yeah.
not heard this where I read it, but I do it. And they say by seven weeks, is it seven weeks? But the puppy should be on seven different surfaces. Have you heard that? No, no, that's okay. So my puppies, and when they're up and walking about, we put them on carpeting. Then the next day we put them on tile, concrete, grass, whatever it is, by a certain age, so that their feet have been on the seven different surfaces. Has anybody else heard that? Oh, okay. I didn't make it up. Well, well, but this, of Patty, course, was after your super puppy. Patty, I don't. I I don't think there's anything wrong in doing that. But but I don't. I don't see any any miracle happening because of that. Well, of course, there was a miracle. <laughs> All my puppies didn't react to strange surfaces. Um, I'm a poodle breeder, and we had a breeders' roundtable at uh, the last National Poodle Club of America in April. It was, it was amazingly wonderful. And one of the uh, people involved in it is a gentleman named Toshi, and he breeds the Smash poodles and he's world famous and as they were talking about keeping puppies every puppy that's born in his facility is kept without question until they are six months of age and so he doesn't play with what can happen he keeps it there and oh it, he he, I'm sorry, he doesn't play with what can happen. He keeps them all there. And I know that that isn't workable physically for a lot of people, but maybe keeping the first, the best two or three that you're seeing that long, really advise it. Thank you. You've just described the advantage he has over everybody else. The longer you yeah. wait, the closer they are to their real size, the more you can see who they are. There's no doubt that is superior than picking them when they're eight weeks old. Okay. You said it was studied in the jungles of Vietnam. Is there is there a rationale for picking those particular ones? Has it ever been really studied? Well, I did. I did say that again. So you mentioned the maneuvers you do with the puppy. You know the. Yeah. Uh, simulation. I mean, that those were developed kind of in the in secret. Is it is it secret that they work, or is, is there really any evidence that does something? Should you be doing all of them? <laughs> yeah. What happened? What ha I'll just tell you quickly about that research. Okay. The head of the research was a guy was a was a colonel named Colonel Castleberry, and he assembled all these researchers. I only happened to know that because I had worked with some of these guys, not knowing they were in the secret project. I sold a puppy to a lady who lived in Washington, D.C. She wanted a pet puppy. I sold her a German Shepherd puppy, and I hadn't seen the puppy. It's now grown. It's a year old. And I thought, well, I'm going to be up there. I'm going to do what I talk about, evaluate my own litters, and go see how this puppy turned out. So I told her I was coming. She says, oh, great. She says, I'll bring the puppy, but I'm having a party for all of the veterinarians who work in our practices, her husband owned like five or six practices up there. So I'm gonna meet her and a puppy at this cocktail party. So it's over in Georgetown. I got lost getting over there. So I got there about 8.30. They'd been drinking for an hour and a half. Okay. <laughs> so everybody was well ahead of me and they were all chatting about their various experiences. And one guy in there used the code word, biosensor. Nobody had, nobody who didn't, you had to know what that word meant to use it. And in that group, nobody would have known it except the guy who was in the project. And he used that word. So I got over there and I started talking to him, complimenting him on all these things and got him to share some of the information that I thought I knew. And so I, I found out a lot about where the records were in some of these things. So I was able to get some of that information. Then I happened to know out at Lackland Air Force Base, which is where one of the breeding programs was going on, the public affairs officer, Hildegard, Hildegard Brown. And she says, well, you know, Colonel Castleberry is here. He got so angry when he quit, he moved back to San Antonio, his home, but he uses the officer's quarters all the time. I says, can you get an interview with him? 
she says, you won't like it because he's mean, he's angry, he's, you know, he doesn't want to talk about this stuff. I said, well, see what you can do. She calls me back and she says, you got 30 minutes. You got to be here at noon, you know, in a week. So I go out there. He's got two officers sitting on either side of him. We're in the, we're in the cafeteria there. And uh, he says, all right, your 30 minutes just started. No paper, no pencils, no video, no nothing, just conversation. So when 30 minutes was up, he got up and walked out. So I had to go out in the hall and write everything down I could remember that we talked about over this period of time and then piece together who I thought in his group might have you know, been involved in this. And one of the things I found out this not in the paper, not in the paper, but was in the research is that one of the things they did with these puppies between three and 16 days of age is that you've been on a, a children's playground where you have these, it's, it's a turntable about so big, the kids jump on it and it goes around like this. When the press found out that was part of the research, they called it a centrifuge. A cent that the government was putting puppies in a centrifuge and that brought the project down. That's why it was shut down over that. So I did not want to mention that in the, in the paper that you read called, called early neurological stimulation, but that's what brought it down. But the period of time, they found that work best was three to 16 days. Now, they didn't go on to explain why. They just said, this is what we found and this is what works. So that's all I can tell you about that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, for the woman who was asking if it works. I can guarantee you that there are people all over this room who will vouch for the sensory stimulation exercises written by Dr. Battaglia. And uh, personally, it changed our lives. Our puppies walk into the ring at six months old with heads and tails up, happy as clams. And uh, I know that there are people all over this room with the same experience. So they work. Thank you, everybody. I'll be here for a couple of days. Great. Thank you. Thank you.